of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. shepherd of your people. Grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Those who had been baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. 
And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Let us read together Psalm 23, found on page 612. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And, and I will dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the first letter of Peter. It is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. The word of the Lord.
Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger. They will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's sermon comes from the Reverend Whitney Rice. Even though we are in a season of Easter, our lives may still feel like one long Lenten discipline of social distancing and fighting illness. Even as we proclaim the truth of Easter resurrection, Good Friday's shadow still looms long. We know that Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is faithful. So let's go to Scripture together and ask to be taught, to be healed, and to be loved. Unlike other Good Shepherd texts, this one is more abstract. John even tells us outright, Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Traditionally, this text has often been used as a means of exclusion. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. People have used this saying to enforce false boundaries, to shore up their own power, labeling anyone who is unorthodox as thieves and bandits. Whether that means you have the wrong gender, sexuality, race, doctrine, belief, politics, liturgy, etc. Not everyone is going to get saved, is the message the powerful take out of this text. Jesus doesn't love everyone is a subliminal, but far more honest attitude underlying the pious concern for being correct. The farther we are driven into anger and fear, the harder it is to see any shades of refinement. When we feel threatened, we sink into black and white, thinking very quickly. All shades of gray are rendered invisible by our primal drive for security. Everything becomes very rigid, and suddenly we love Jesus' image of the sheepfold with a gate that is going to keep some people out because, by implication, it will keep those of us on the inside safe. We will have a holy and secure isolation from those people who will no longer be a threat. In this circle the wagons mentality, everything and everyone becomes rigidly locked into place. We imprison ourselves and everyone around us into roles of good guy and bad guy. There is very little freedom in that place and very little love. When we first read the gospel, especially if we are feeling vulnerable, threatened, and longing for security, all we see are walls, barriers, boundaries, and separation. That's what a fence with a gate is, right? But that is not what Jesus is talking about when he says, I am the gate. He's not trying to keep people out or even allow us to stay safely in, nor is he trying to make us feel like we're not good enough to be let in, to join the insiders inside the sheepfold. What is the purpose of the gate? It is precisely to create an opening in the fence. It is precisely to allow travel through the wall. It is a means of liberation, not a means of exclusion. When Jesus says, I am the gate, it is his way of inviting us both in and out. He is telling us that he is our way to safety, to entering a restful place where we know we are loved and protected. But he is also telling us that we will need to go back out through that gate into the world. 
It is his invitation to leave safety and security and go back out into a world of challenges and stumbling blocks. We might expect that of Jesus, that he would tell us that we are safe, but that there is more to life than safety. We could understand that he does not promise a sanctuary, but he also expects us to go back out and do the good work we are called to do, knowing that it may sometimes end with us feeling battered and bruised. <clears throat> but where Jesus really gets subversive is when he calls himself the gate. He's not just saying there is a gate in all your carefully constructed, self-isolating walls. He's saying, I am the gate in all your carefully constructed, self-isolating walls. It's this stealthy, undermining means of salvation that is utterly brilliant. Because that means that everything that we have labeled as a barrier is actually Jesus. Everything we have set up to protect ourselves is actually our very means of being called out into life of adventure, possibility, and yes, strife and conflict. And those careful walls we've placed between ourselves and others, Jesus is the gate. He's made himself a secret entrance into our hardened hearts. And all kinds of scary people are going to get in. When we fully understand that Jesus is the gate, Jesus is the entry point into all change, depth, struggle, and love. It's simultaneously terrifying and exhilarating. As the saying goes, God loves us exactly as we are, and God loves us far too much to leave us that way. Martin Laird in Into the Silent Land tells a powerful story. He speaks of walking across a moor with a friend who had four dogs. As they walked, three of the dogs would run out across the moor, leaping over creeks and chasing rabbits and joyfully exploring their environment. But one of the dogs would only run in a small circle right in front of his owner. No matter how many miles they walked or how far afield the other dogs went, this dog would only run in a tight circle very close to them. Laird asked him why, and he replied, This dog was kept for his entire life prior to coming to me in a very small cage. His body has left the cage, but his mind still carries it with him. For him, the world outside the cage does not exist. And so no matter how big and beautiful the moor, he will never run out across it. I bring him here so he can breathe the fresh air, but he's still running in circles in his cage. <clears throat> On a good day when we're feeling confident and happy in God's love, seeing the glory of God's people and God's creation all around us, gray is beautiful. We set aside the comforting security of black and white, thinking and dive into the shadow land between. Gray is possibility, opportunity, the treasure hidden in the field. We can handle and even appreciate nuance, subtlety, ambiguity, and the uncertainty that, the, that is the foundational characteristics of faith. <clears throat> but when we are hurting, weary, afraid, not only can we no longer see the shades of gray, we no longer want to. We are the dog who carries the cage with him out onto the moor. We think we're keeping ourselves safe. We think we're obeying the rules, but really, we're our own jailers. We're refusing to see the open gate in our hearts. We're refusing to see Jesus. <clears throat> but we know Jesus is patient with our willful blindness. He says to all of us, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Sometimes we wish there were no gate. Sometimes we wish the barriers and boundaries we've placed around our hearts were bulletproof and siege resistant. But before long, God reminds us that aching hole in our hearts where insight and possibility and all of these people, beautiful, flawed people, keep sneaking in. That is the very presence of Jesus who brings us rest in green pastures besides the still waters. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. I ask your prayers today for God's people throughout the world. For our companion diocese of El Salvador, we pray for Iglesio Cristo Rey, Bajo Lempa, Usulatan, and their priest, the Reverend Antonio Lopez. For our parishes in the North Country, we pray for Church of the St. Lawrence in Alexandria Bay and their vicar, the Reverend Lisa Busby. For Saints Peter and John Church in Auburn and their rector, the Reverend Kathleen Schofield. We pray for this gathering, Trinity Church Watertown and Trinity Church Lowville. We give thanks for the ministry of our Tuesday morning knitting group, for the companionship and caring hearts that it offers our city. We pray for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. We pray for every government managing limited health care resources during this COVID-19 response. We pray for the leaders of this country who are making decisions about the economic health of our country. We pray especially for those who have been furloughed, laid off or fired as a result of COVID-19. We pray for the poor and disenfranchised who are always hardest hit during times of crisis. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, especially the Guio family, Carolyn, Chris, Mary, Jan, Ian, Bob, and Norma, and for their families and friends who comfort and encourage them. We pray especially for those who are gravely ill from COVID-19, that God may be present to them in their weakness and bring them in strength to a new day. We pray for our urban mission, for hospice of Jefferson County, and for Meals on Wheels as they meet basic needs for food and companionship during this crisis. We pray for those who have died alone during this crisis. We pray for the doctors and nurses caring for all who are sick. May they be strengthened with Christ's life-giving spirit. May their ministry to the health of our community be known and God's creation glorified. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. We pray for those who are wrestling with the issues of faith. We pray for all who are facing deep discouragement and hopelessness today and at this time of their lives. May they know the peace that passes understanding Pray that all may find and be found by God.
I ask your prayers for the departed. We pray especially for those who are suffering from COVID-19 and for those who have died without being able to touch their families. We pray for those whose funerals have been delayed by this pandemic and for their families who mourn. We pray for funeral directors and their employees who work faithfully at this time to meet the needs of families. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. May God give you grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. <laughs>